Feed is a film from 2005 that, in my opinion, is an interesting study of when graphic and gruesome imagery and ideas in film turn to comedy. Feed is interesting in that it isn't a film that is so bad it's good, it isn't badly made, but it is handled in a very unusual way. Feed is directed by Brett Leonard, whose breakout film, and perhaps the film he is still best known for, was the movie about VR that all the kids are still talking about, The Lawnmower Man. Is that my hand? Feed is about Philip, an Australian cop whose job is to seemingly trawl the internet at random, finding bad touch websites and busting pervs. He stumbles across a website with a great deal of security, becomes obsessed, and flies to the USA without any approval from his boss. There, through a series of confrontations, he uncovers the truth of the website, run by Michael. Michael's bag is to find overweight women, convince them that trying to become a metric ton isn't an awful idea, and run bets on when they're going to die. He also seemingly feeds some of the fat from their corpses to the next gainer. So, especially with the part at the end, you probably get the idea that this film is about body horror or extreme horror, or just something with nasty images aplenty. Of course, my description doesn't convey the most intangible part of movies, the tone and the way movies are handled. Because it could be extreme body horror that's as ridiculous as it is gross. It could be something gritty, like 8mm, which I read was something the director was trying to emulate in terms of tone. Or it could be very thoughtful, morbid and tragic. The thing about Feed is I think that the script offers pretty interesting ideas, and the lead performances from Alex Laughlin and Patrick Thompson are pretty solid. It's the tone of the film that undermines its shock value, and what makes it funny, as well as the anomalous direction. For example, the film begins with Philip raiding the well-kept on the outside, Ed Gaines decor on the inside, home of a cannibal, who is reminiscent of the real-life Rottenberg cannibal, so one of the first things we see, and I think the strongest image in the entire film, is a severed dick in a frying pan. Or a sculpted sausage in a frying pan. Anyway, if you don't want to see it, look away now. Now, I know this is a nitpick, but just go along with me here. Two people have met in a chat room, and they have agreed that one is going to eat the other. I imagine that this is quite a lengthy process. You've got to screen out the time wasters and everything like that. With that in mind, I just don't think that two people would meet up, one of them would have their penis amputated, they would start to cook it, and this thing, this thing that they have no doubt talked about for such a long time, would be in a frying pan and they would look at it and go, this is boring, let's have a bath. Anyway, after this, Philip, the Australian internet online policeman who for some reason flew all the way to Germany for a bust the local cops were no doubt very capable of, comes home to Bonsai Beach, yes really, and his non-conventional and really quite irrelevant relationship with his girlfriend is smeared all over the audience's collective face. Well, I'm sorry, but... I fucked three other guys and two other girls while you were away, and I'm still here. If they had that sort of relationship, I'm not sure that they would really speak like that. But much more importantly, the dick in a frying pan and the very vocal polyamory are both indicative of a film that is trying very hard. It makes a very big deal about people finding fat women attractive. And I don't know, maybe 2005 was a bit different, but I don't think slender men getting their rocks off with very fat ladies was ever particularly shocking. To me, Feed never really treats its subject matter with any more depth than, hey look at this, a fit successful guy is into really fat women, isn't that weird? Oh, and dependency issues too. Really, this obese woman, who Michael is feeding to death with her consent, is about as shocking as the film gets. I mean, aside from the dick in a frying pan. I really do think that it treats this fat naked woman as being incredibly grotesque because she's fat. But you know what? I've seen a lot of fat people and I'm pretty much over it. But of course I jest. The shock is really meant to be in the behaviour. But this and its shocking imagery are undermined by its pop music montages. 
and as I have alluded to, scenes that are just baffling. Take, for example, this scene, where Philip, having essentially taken leave of both his senses and policing 101, approaches Michael's sister by adoption like this. I always find the beautiful girls come out first thing in the morning, just like the flowers. Anyway, the rest of the scene is this. From Sydney, Australia. Is that near Japan? What's your name? Nigel. You like Burger King? Madam, it's 8 a.m. Of course I like Burger King. My point is, is that this scene is both unnecessary and bizarre. It doesn't need to be shot at times with a weird predator cam that appears nowhere else in the film. But it is only one of many bizarre choices, and I use the word bizarre because it isn't necessarily incompetent. This isn't a B-movie with a wobbly camera and Red Brown holding up his girdle. It may not be a masterpiece, but they obviously decided to frame this scene in a certain way, overexpose the background, have the handheld perv shots, and use that just like the flowers line. It's much more deliberate than a film that some amateurs just made. There's also this peculiar delivery by Deirdre, the fat lady, when Philip comes to rescue her. Very carefully listen to what she says and how she says it. You don't understand. He's killing you. Do I look dead to you, pussy boy? You know, there's a certain phrase in a director's lexicon which I think should be used more. And it goes a bit like this. Do it again. But then again saying that, it is hilarious. Another scene like this is when Philip breaks into Michael's house then has the first of several standoffs with Michael outside. The scene, a Mexican standoff in somebody's front garden, without any guns, ends with Philip saying and doing this. Get off my property before I call the police. Call the police. It's one of the many moments in this film that makes me smile. He just runs away. This scene is then immediately followed by another confrontation in the house where Deirdre was being stored. The director said that he deliberately under-rehearsed his actors to get a certain level of spontaneity and a bit of improvisation. But this scene, and the scene after it in a motel room, where Michael poisons Philip, all retread the same sentiments. In fact, so much so, the dialogue often feels like we've already heard it. True beauty isn't about anorexic women who would crack their pelvises if they were to try to give birth to a baby. To be free of the social pressure to conform. And yet, because of things like Philip running away, or Do I look dead to you, posse boy? It never gets boring. Ever. The face-off of this film is literally half an hour long. In fact, I think that's me being kind to it. I think it might have actually started 50 minutes in. And the face-off, the confrontation between these three characters, ends like this. Shoot the hostage, they said in speed. But not in the head. Anyway, we never learn what happens to Michael's wife, who was last seen tied up in the back of Phil's car, and I have to say, who cares? And the film ends with Philip living with Michael's sorta sister, and this. I can't hear you. Say it. Feed me. Which I think is a pretty cool way of ending. A way that fits into the genre that this film is apparently a part of. You see, if you look at this clip from Saw 7 or Saw 3D, where three people are trapped in a perspex box and are forced to battle it out, knowing someone will die, it's obviously ridiculous. In real life, I think people would look around, wondering what to do, wondering if it was a magic trick, for about 15 seconds. Then they would start to react. As soon as those saws started, and the people started screaming for help, people would be banging on those windows, trying to knock them through. Someone would probably have a gun and shoot those windows out. It's the middle of a city centre. I think the police would probably be there in seconds. And of course, then there's the question of, how did this all get here? But it doesn't matter. It's not meant to be taken seriously. You're not meant to doubt the logic behind the situation. In these sorts of films, it's about who's going to die next, and it's about spectacle. And Feed doesn't have that. 
Like Saw, or something like The Human Centipede 3, this film isn't set in reality. Feed is not an attempt at the ultra-serious, but unlike those films, it offers a far weaker level of body horror. Its fried penis is about as far as it goes. And like I say, for a film that demands that you suspend your disbelief, that really isn't enough. It may gross you out, but that fried penis is kind of funny. It just doesn't have enough, but I also think it's not particularly self-aware as a film. The only joke in the entire film is when Philip tells Deirdre not to go anywhere, and it feels out of place. But while I think the film, which doesn't take itself entirely seriously, could have worked better as an out-and-out -out spoof, or on the other hand, something incredibly serious and genuinely upsetting, along the same tonal line as the cellar scene in the road, that would make it a very different film. And whilst Feed isn't going to satisfy anyone's lust for suspense or blood, it is very entertaining. Like The Room, it's entertaining in a way that it wasn't meant to be, but unlike The Room, it's not because it's bad, but because it's weird. Its real misfiring is in its tone rather than its execution, and I think this is best demonstrated by the last 10 seconds of the movie and the opening of its end credits. The ending is the most sinister part of the whole movie. Our protagonist is starving someone to death. It's as close as they come to creating an actual atmosphere, and they undermine it all with that music. This is how the Silence of the Lambs would feel with the same music at the end. I do wish we could chat longer, but I'm having an old friend for dinner. Bye. A mix of cliched writing, but interesting ideas, along with a delivery that, if you like that sort of thing, makes this movie very funny, means that Feed is a genuine oddity. Even when I think there were better alternatives, I can usually grasp why a certain directorial decision was made. But here, Feed left me questioning everything I thought I knew. With movies that are just bad, you can usually see why a decision was made, and you can argue why that doesn't work, but the decisions in Feed just baffle me. It could be that in a hundred years, Feed is the film that people are talking about. It was the first in a new film movement, one that hasn't started yet. It could be the pinnacle of filmmaking, but probably not. Well, I have to hand it to the director. He made a very entertaining movie. Thank you very much for joining me. Be sure to tune in next time, where I will be discussing the importance of race in the Planet of the Apes series. Don't forget to like and comment if you are so inclined. See you then.